If you'd like to join me tonight for a few minutes from John chapter 11. John 11, we'll focus our attention there for just a few minutes. Um, One of the ways that has been helpful to me as far as studying goes in the scriptures in my own personal studies is that, uh, I guess, or at least a helpful way to me is to glance at phrases in series of verses or in paragraphs and to break down each of those phrases. And sometimes I like to preach like that where we'll just go through a text and go phrase by phrase, and it sort of helps me understand the context, sometimes the words. Uh, But rarely do we just focus on one phrase and break down each word of that singular phrase. And I had not net, not ever done that or preached that way uh, until recently when I was reading through John 11. And there was one phrase, and Clay read it for us, and we'll give some attention to it in just a second. But that singular phrase I thought was powerful and convicting and insightful in some ways in helping us understand better Jesus, his mission, and what he was able to do for Mary and Martha and for Lazarus uh, in a time that was very difficult for them. Uh, And so as we give our attention then to John 11, I guess we could start back at verse number 1 and set the stage for what's happening so that we could understand those two verses that Clay read for us just a little bit better. In verse number 1 of John 11, you learned that Lazarus was in Bethany, where he and Mary and Martha lived some 70 miles away from Galilee, where Jesus was at the time. We know Jesus was in Galilee from John 10 and verse 40, where he had gone across the Jordan uh, and was there at the place where John had been baptizing earlier and remained there. So Jesus in John 11 is stationed at Galilee preaching to the multitudes, and he gets news that Lazarus is nearing the point of death, that he's really sick, he's eventually going to die. So the sister sent a message, verse number three, this one that Jesus loves is sick. And when Jesus hears it, he says, this won't end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Verse five, now Jesus loved Martha, her sister and Lazarus, so that when he heard he was sick, He stayed two more days in the place where he was. Then after that, says to the disciples, let's go to Judea again. The disciples said in verse number 8, Just now the Jews tried to stone you, and you're going to go back to that place? Aren't there 12 hours in a day, Jesus said? And if anyone walks during the day, he doesn't stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks during the night... He does not stump he does stumble rather because the light is not in him. He said this and then he told them, "Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep and I'm on my way to wake him up." The disciples said to him, "Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he will get well." Jesus, however, was speaking about his death. They thought he was talking about natural sleep. So Jesus told them plainly, verse 14, "Lazarus has died. I'm glad for you that I wasn't there so that you may believe. I'm I'm glad Jesus says that I'm not there in Lazarus's presence so now I can do something to help you understand. And that was always a problem with the disciples, wasn't it? Where Jesus would be talking about one thing and then someone else didn't understand and he would have to clarify. It's already happened twice I know of in the book of John up until this point. In John 3 it happened with Nicodemus when Jesus says a man must be born again of the water in the spirit. And Nicodemus says, well, how can that happen? A man can't enter into his mother's womb a second time. And Jesus says, no, a man must be born again of the water and the spirit. So he misunderstood him there. In John 4, Jesus says, I'll give you water that you'll never thirst again. And the woman at the well was a little bit confused because she was like, you don't even have a bucket to draw water. And Jesus says, no, you don't understand. The water that I'll give you, you'll never be thirsty again. And so that was a trend. It happened a lot with people, not necessarily understanding what Jesus was about. And so it happened in John chapter 10, verse number 17. Jesus arrived some four days after he finds out that Lazarus had been dead, or at least after he finds out that Lazarus was dying, he had died and been that way for four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, less than two miles away. Many of the Jews had come to Mary and Martha to comfort them about their brother. And as soon as Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she runs to meet him, but Mary stays back at the house. And like Martha 
uh, I think, naturally would say to Jesus, like, where were you? Why weren't you here? Why didn't you come quickly? We told you that Lazarus was dying. Why did it take you four days to get here? Seventy miles was a pretty long distance, I guess, if you're walking, but it really wasn't a four-day journey. So, so why did it take Jesus so long to get there? Yet, even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you, Martha says. So even though she's frustrated, probably a little bit emotional that it took Jesus so long to get there, she still admits that she knows something to be true about God, that if he were to, rather Jesus, that if he were to ask God something, anything, God would grant it to him, that there was something special about Jesus that made him able to receive that from God. Verse 23, your brother will rise again, Jesus says. Martha said to him, I know that he will in the resurrection on the last day. Again, here's another case of not really quite understanding what Jesus was saying. So verse 25, Jesus says, no, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe that? She said, yes, Lord, I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God who comes into the world. Having said this, verse 28, she went back and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and is calling for you. Some of your Bibles might say, the master has come and he is calling for you. That singular phrase just caught my attention when I was reading John 11. Usually it's John 11, verse 35, right? Jesus wept. That only happened just very few times, I think three in the New Testament. That's usually the notable phrase. But John 11:28, 28, that phrase, the teacher is here and is calling for you, or the master has come and is calling for you. I would propose to you tonight that that phrase is powerful, it's convicting, and it's insightful. It's insightful in that it helps us understand Jesus and his mission even more. And so if you will, for a few minutes, let's break down the words of that statement in John eleven twenty-eight 28, that Mary gives to her sister Martha in this terrible time, the master is here and he is calling for you. I'm going to use the words, the master, instead of the words, the teacher. Most modern translations, I think, uh, the ESV and the NIV, the CSB, anything like that, newer translations will say the teacher. I think the King James Version reads the master, and some of your others might see that as well. For the sake of or all intents and purposes, I guess, I'm going to use the master uh, and here's why. Let's focus our attention then on those first two words. Your Bibles might say the master or the teacher. I think the master is a better translation in this case. I think sometimes we read our King James and our New King James, and then we might grab a newer translation to see if there's an easier way to understand those words. And not that teacher is a bad translation, not that it's wrong translation, or the master is better in some way because it's more right. That's not necessarily necessarily true, but I think the message that it conveys is stronger. The image that is put in the mind of Mary as she hears the words, the master, I think that's a good translation that really depicts what Jesus was about to do in their house. All right, not that he couldn't have done it if she would have understood that Jesus was a teacher, because he was. He was the master teacher. There was no one that ever taught like him. They would say that on multiple occasions about his teaching. But master describes well what Jesus was about to do in John 11 in the house of Mary and Martha. And it's a a fitting way to describe what Jesus had done already in his ministry. You think about up until this point how many times Jesus had mastered something how he had mastered nature when the winds and the waves and the rain were raging on the Sea of Galilee. And at the words of Jesus, he could just say, peace be still, and everything would stop. Jesus mastered nature. Think about how Jesus mastered Satan when Satan tempted him and, and told him, look, if you'll just bow down to me or if you'll just confess that I'm the ruler, if you'll just say these things or do these things, then you can have anything you want. And Jesus didn't. He mastered Satan. Think about how Jesus up until this point had mastered sickness, how so many people had been brought to Jesus with ailments and, and physical difficulties and all kinds of diseases. And, and usually at the touch of Jesus or at the word of Jesus, those sicknesses or ailments or pains would just disappear. Jesus was truly the master overall. 
He was the Lord of Lords or the King of Kings. That's what we focused on this morning about God's ability to be supreme. In fact, that title, the Lord God, that we notice from Revelation, it too is ascribed to Jesus. On three occasions, I know, two of which are in 1 Corinthians, do you read the words, Lord Jesus? There's something about Jesus that demands our attention as far as His supremacy and majesty and His ability to be a master. And so when you read that in John 11 and verse 28. Not that teacher isn't a faithful saying or a faithful description of Jesus, because it is. He is a teacher, the master teacher. But I like those words, the master, because it describes perfectly what he had already done. He was a master over nature, a master over sickness, a master over Satan. And by the time you finish John 11, he becomes the master over death because he raises Lazarus from the dead. So when you read those words, the master, that's who we're dealing with. Jesus, the master over nature, the master over sickness, the master over Satan, and the master over death itself. Read on in John 11 in verse number 28. John 11 and verse 28. Mary is told by her sister, the master, the next two words are, is here. Or some of your Bibles might say, the master has come. Either one is fine. I think they both describe a reality, a present reality, that Jesus was literally, physically in the presence of Martha when she was going to tell her sister, Jesus is here. Now, you think about what that would have meant for a Jew to hear the words, Jesus is here, or the master is here, because all of their fathers and all of their ancestors had been anticipating the day when God's son, the Messiah, would come to the earth, and he would rule, and he would reign, and he would wipe out all of their oppressors. At least that's what they thought in their mind. We see in the New Testament there was a little bit of a misunderstanding about the role of the Messiah, because they were thinking a physical earthly king, but he was more than that, and he tells them on more multiple occasions. My kingdom isn't of this world, but either way, Jesus still ruled and reigned in the kingdoms of men. And so when you have Jesus standing there, literally, physically, in the presence of Martha, and then she says to her sister, go, the master is here, or he has come, what it would have done to the heart of someone who is a Jew. That it wasn't a vision, it wasn't an apparition, it wasn't a dream, it wasn't some fiction story that someone made up, that Jesus was literally, physically standing in Bethany that day. When Martha says, Mary, the master is here, he has come, what it would have done to their hearts. And they literally saw those prophecies be fulfilled, that at the power of Jesus' voice, he says, Lazarus, come forth, and he does, he comes from the grave. I think it was Marshall Keeble that's credited for saying that Jesus had to say, Lazarus, come forth, because his voice had so much power that if he had just said, come forth, then everybody that was in the ground would have risen. That's, that's how powerful Jesus is and his words and his voice. So when he says, Lazarus, come forth, it was just a powerful way of affirming to Mary and Martha that Jesus the Messiah was, in fact, literally in their presence. And I can't help but think when I read John 11, especially knowing the events that have happened, that Lazarus, the friend of Jesus and the brother of Mary and Martha had died, how blessed that Mary and Martha were that Jesus was there that Jesus had come, that it wasn't just a dream, it wasn't a story that someone made up, that Jesus was literally, physically there. Now, the good news for us is Jesus is not literally, physically here in the flesh where we can see him occupying a pew, but we know that Jesus is here, and we know that he has come. And as real as Jesus was to Mary and Martha in their tragedy in John 11, that Jesus is as real to us in this present moment as he was to them. And he even affirms on more than one occasion, Jesus does, to those who have seen him and believed, but even more blessed are those who have not literally physically seen him yet still believe. That's what he would tell Thomas later on in this very same book in John. Blessed are those who have not yet seen, but still believe. The master is here. He has come. And that comforts the hearts of believers uh, all through the years, even until the present moment. John 11 and verse 28, the next phrase. The master is here, or the master has come, and is calling. And is calling. What would that have been like? Or what weight do those words, and is 
calling? What, what would that have meant to Mary and Martha, or particularly Mary, because she was being called by the Master Jesus? What might that have said to Mary's heart? Maybe how would we relate to that calling? I, I want to depict it in two different ways. I want to direct your mind to a couple of the songs that we sing, and then I want to give you three passages in the Scripture that I think just show you the call and how it relates to us. The three songs are this. Softly and tenderly we sing, Jesus is calling, right? And we understand that when we, when we say softly and tenderly Jesus is calling, it is this imploring from Jesus. It's, it's this begging from Jesus for us to yield ourselves to Him so that we can pour out what's burdening us on Him and He can inevitably deal with it properly if we'll just give it to him. He's begging or imploring us to yield ourselves to him softly and tenderly. Another one we sing, Sweetly, Lord, have we heard thee calling. Come, follow me. We know what that means. We know that Jesus is imploring and he's begging us. And when we sing those words, we usually sing them as invitation songs, imploring and begging someone to realize what Jesus is asking us to do, literally to just yield ourselves to him. What about this one? Hear the sweet voice of Jesus say, come unto me, I am the way. We, we know what that means, right? Jesus is saying, I have gone this way before. I've, I've seen it all and I've experienced it all. And I'm begging you to yield to me. I'm imploring you to yield to me so that I can show you what I can do for you in your life. Three occasions in the scripture that I can remember where there was a clear-cut call from God or God the Son, Jesus Christ. The first is in Isaiah 1 in verse 18 where Isaiah is speaking to a gainsaying and negative and abrasive rebellious people and his words literally from God as he laid them on his tongue were this, come and let us Reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And I mean, those are those are the worst people that were, I mean, ever, really. They had gone so far away from their covenant with God. And Isaiah would get frustrated because he would preach and preach and, and, and often to, to a very, very wicked and rebellious crowd. In fact, he says later in the book in Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, that their sins had separated from them from God, that, that they had become so wicked and so gainsaying and so rebellious that they, they were just, they were in a terrible position. Yet the book opens with a call, an imploring, a begging for someone to yield themselves to God so that he could have his way in their life. What about this in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30? I know that we know that one pretty much by heart. Jesus said, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He says, take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest to your souls. Jesus, what are you saying? What, what were you trying to communicate to your disciples? I, I want you to come to me, and I want you to lay everything that you have down at my feet. Yield to me. Yes, you do have to take on something. That's the taking my yoke, but I'll guide you, and I'll keep you in the direction you need to go if you'll just submit to me. The New Testament literally concludes with a calling. Revelation 22 and verse 17, where John records the words of Jesus, The Spirit and the bride say, Come. Let all who would hear, come. Let all who are thirsty, come and drink of the water of life freely. Three times, and more than that really, but explicitly three times do you have this image of God literally imploring and begging for you and me to yield our lives to Jesus so that he can have his way with us. What happened with Mary and Martha? Martha wanted Mary to know that Jesus was imploring her in the most terrible time in a tragic situation, where else can you find an answer other than the presence of Jesus? Martha said, the master is here and he is calling. He's imploring and he's begging, right? But read the next phrase, John 11 and verse 28. The master is here or has come and is calling for, I like that word, you. Not that Martha wasn't imploring or being implored by Jesus to come and, and, and 
revel in the glory and the joy that Jesus had to offer, not that Martha was ever excluded, or not that anyone else in the world was excluded from what Jesus had to offer, but I can't help but think of how personal it must have felt for Mary to hear those words from her sister, Jesus is calling for you. He wants you, you specifically, and what that must have done for Mary's heart. I think of it in two ways. The first is, I remember what it's like to be chosen. I remember that, you know, uh, when I had been denied uh, permission to date Heidi multiple times from Heidi, not from anybody else. Her mom wanted it to happen, I guess, but Heidi didn't. And and I was denied, you know, a few times. But then the, the one time Heidi said yes, like how it felt to just be chosen, you know, like it was like, yes, you know, that, that joy. We all know what it feels like to be chosen, whether it's in a relationship, whether it's on the playground and you were picked to play on the football team at recess, or, or, or maybe you were chosen to make a cut of a special band ensemble, or maybe, maybe you were chosen to represent your school in some sort of academic way, or, or maybe you were chosen for a promotion at work. Like, you know what I mean. When, it, when you are chosen, when, when it's set apart and says, we want you, the emotions that you have in your heart because of the, the value that you feel, the worth that is attached to you at that moment because someone chose you. Now think of the adverse. Think of what it's like to not be chosen. Think of what it's like when you're not the one that the person you're interested in chooses. Or think about when you're up for a promotion and they choose someone else. Or think about when you're standing in line on the playground at recess and you're the last one standing there and the team captain that it's his pick says, well, I guess we have to take Ty because he's the only one left. That's a terrible feeling. You know, it's an awful feeling to not be chosen, and we could probably relate to that in some ways or another. All of the positive emotions about being chosen, specifically, I want you, and all of the emotions that come with not being chosen, the pain and the tragedy that are associated therewith. Now, think about how tragic it would be if Jesus were selective with who he chose, because there's actually doctrine in the religious world that says that some of us are out of luck. I mean, religious bodies teach that, that if this, this were all the humans on the earth, that there are just a few of you that are out of luck, that God had already determined beforehand which of us he's going to be saved, and sadly, Tim Davenport, I'm sorry, you're not one of them. You know, how would Tim feel if that's how Jesus operated? It's ridiculous. It's hogwash that people teach. That's not how Jesus works, but that's what they believe, that there's a select group of people that are chosen, and if you're not one of them, I'm sorry, buddy, it's over. You know, you have no chance of going to heaven. If Jesus worked like that, it would be miserable, but it's not. That Jesus literally, specifically invited every person, just like it was personal for Mary in that moment. There was not one person in Bethany, not one person in the region of Jerusalem, not one person, yeah, even that occupied the earth that couldn't have responded to that call the same way that Mary did. There's not one person that was exempt from the call in Matthew 11, 28 through 30. There's not one person that's exempt from the call in Revelation 22 and verse 17. There's not one Israelite that was exempt from the call in Isaiah 1 and verse 18. The point I'm trying to get at is, even if it was just you, even if it was just you, I mean, out of all, every, this invitation is immensely universal. It speaks to all of us, but it's immensely personal that it is extended to you as it was to Mary. Jesus is calling for you, and tonight, it's the same thing. That while Jesus invites the masses and bids us all to come to him, he literally implores that me, individually, I would make a decision to yield my life to him, to take advantage what he has to offer. Jesus died for you. Jesus died for me. It's immensely personal. So my question for you is, as we read John 11 and verse 28, the master is calling for you. He is here and calling for you. How will you respond? Maybe some of you have never obeyed the gospel and you realize now that Jesus literally implores you to come to him. He wants you to yield your life to him so that you can reap the benefits of what he has to offer, that he's willing to reach out to us in the muck and the mire of our tragedy and in our sin and plant our feet on higher ground. Will you turn to him? Will you yield to that call? Will you listen? Will you heed? Will you obey? Maybe you are a Christian. 
Maybe, maybe what you needed to be reminded of is that Jesus is still calling you. He's imploring you that you'll choose him every day, that in the muck and the mire of your tragedy and in your sin and in your struggles, that still, even now, it's intensely personal that Jesus wants you to yield your life to him. Do that if you need to. If we can help you in any way, we invite you to come to the Master, Jesus Christ, as we stand and as we sing.